Gang War, Bangin' in Little Rock, is a 1994 documentary film that explores the gang violence in Little Rock, Arkansas, during the early 1990s. The HBO film focuses on the ongoing conflict between two rival gangs, the Bloods, and the Crips detailing the devastating impact that their violence had on the community. The controversial documentary elicited a range of responses and criticisms from viewers and critics alike. Some of the criticisms leveled against the movie were concerns about the film's graphic content, which includes scenes of real-life violence, and questions about the filmmaker's objectivity and approach to the subject matter. According to FBI Uniform Crime Reports, Little Rock had a violent crime rate of 1,524 per 100,000 inhabitants in 1994, which was one of the highest in the country at the time. This included 76 homicides, 737 robberies, 754 aggravated assaults, and 35 rapes reported to law enforcement that year. There eventually was a sequel which released in the year 2004, it was a follow-up, and revisited some of the individuals and communities featured in the first film. The follow-up documentary does a great job of exploring how the city had changed over the course of a decade. But that was almost 20 years ago, and I think this groundbreaking film is due for a well-deserved revisit. Join me as we catch up with some of the biggest stars from the first film, and see what they are up to nowadays. Uh, other vibes are still shooting us uh Breaking news as we come on the air tonight. Hours before Little Rock marks five years since more than two dozen people were shot in a downtown nightclub, Little Rock police confirm an arrest warrant is active for someone living out of state. The detectives believe is connected to that early morning chaos. Officers have not publicly identified the person yet, but we're told charges range from tampering with evidence to aggravated assault. Here's Kara K4's Mitch McCoy to walk us through what happened that night almost five years ago. Start to the shooting just occurred 220 West 6, 220 West 6 Street at Power Ultra Lounge. Uh, we're getting some multiple calls on this. Somebody said they heard gunshots inside the club, and we are being advised multiple people shot. Kenneth Myron Johnson, or Crip Mo, as he is known on the streets, was at the Power Ultra Lounge during the shooting. Authorities said Johnson, now over 50, was working as a bouncer at the club and seized a gun for the police after it was allegedly used in the shooting. Johnson is said to have established the Crips in Little Rock in the early 90s. Also known as L.A. Mo and Latif Muhammad, he was featured in the documentary and became for a while one of Little Rock's most notorious gang members, even after he said he disavowed First gang First started violence. in Little Rock for money. You can get a half ounce in L.A. for about 500. Out here you can sell it for a thousand. We make motherfucking money, like cuz! <laughs> I came in Little Rock in 87. It was like if Clint Eastwood would have came out here, they would just want to be like Dirty Harry. You know, so I was just something new to him. And they gave me that much more respect. They gave, they wanted to be like The me. shootout lasted 11 seconds and started about 30 seconds into a break from a concert by rapper Finesse two times. An eyewitness stated that the attack happened during the performance and was unexpected, with a large number of individuals lying on the floor in an attempt to avoid the bullets. A former gang member, L.A. Mo, just so happened to be employed at this very same club, working as a bouncer at the time. July 1st, 2017, a day our city will never forget. The dude that was in front of me, I seen him get shot in his shoulder. Around 2.30 in the morning, 25 people were hit by gunfire. If he wasn't in front of me, I would have got hit in my face. Three more people were hurt while trying to escape, one person jumped from a second story window. So far, only a few arrests. For the first time, we're getting a rare glimpse into what crime scene investigators saw that night. You see a pair of women's heels, a cell phone, and then these evidence stickers measuring the bullet holes. Some of those evidence stickers are still up on the walls today. I got patted down. Everyone should have got patted down like me. I don't know how the guns got in. That's something we're still trying to get into. L.A. Mo had a protege named Bobby Banks, a former gang leader in Little Rock. That, you know, I was going to school and shit. I wasn't fucked up about gang banging. I didn't know nothing about gang banging. He was gang banging and what they was doing looked fun to me. You know what I'm saying? They was cripping and shit and they had cars and money and this and that and they was out on their own, you know. 
I feel like I'm too hard to die, man. I feel like I can't see faded, you know. I feel like can't no nigga fade me. I feel like I'm the hardest nigga walk the earth and shit, you know. L.A. Mo had a protege named Bobby Banks, a former gang leader in Little Rock, and he was convicted of running a large drug trafficking organization in 2006. Bobby Banks was sentenced to 55 years in prison with five years of supervised release. In addition to various drug trafficking offenses, Banks was also convicted of attempting to intimidate a judicial officer by threat. Banks and 16 of his associates were involved in a large-scale conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine in the Little Rock area. According to witness testimony during trial, Banks was the leader of a criminal organization that operated a series of crack houses in the Central High neighborhood. This activity took place from December 1999 to November 2004. I dug a little deeper into the sad story of what happened to Bobby Banks, and discovered unfortunately, Bobby Banks was unable to keep his son out of the same circle of violence and incarceration. According to Little Rock Police, officers have now arrested his son Bobby Banks Jr., who was wanted in a homicide that took place in October 2021. The victim was identified as 19-year-old Keith Harris, and Little Rock Police announced on November 8, 2021, that they have arrested Bobby Banks Jr. as a suspect for first-degree murder in his homicide case. Bangin' in Little Rock also featured a female Caucasian gang member named Taz, who was supposedly a member of the Folk Nation in a all-white gang set based in Little Rock. In the documentary, Taz is shown participating in gang activities and is interviewed about her involvement in the gang. For many who have seen this film, she was definitely a standout character, but in case you forgot, here is a reminder. Several of the girls that I know of have been raped. I got beat in. And why did you choose to get beat in and not sexed? Because to me, having sex has got to mean something. And, I don't, and plus, I know that uh, the girls that do get sexed in, they ain't looked at as a G, really. There ain't very many people that show her respect. And I wanted the respect and I wanted the love. Right before I got quoted, everybody's asked me, well, what do you want? What do you want? I said, I just want you guys to love me. Isn't that right? If you in your hood and some punk ass hoe come rolling through your hood and try to blast on you or something, you got to take care of your hood. You know what I'm saying? Because that's where you live. These days, don't nobody give a fuck about you. Don't nobody give a fuck about you. Don't nobody give a fuck about nobody. Unless, unless you know, unless like my G's give a fuck about me. You know, that's pretty much the only people I got. My whole family disowned me and I really don't give a fuck. I heard when he be stacking, he be throwing that hoop. And I also heard this. I also heard that when he be stacking, he throw he throw hoop down like this and roll it up like we do slobs. Fuck him. Fuck him. They talk all that bullshit, man, but they hood so easy to take off. They went over there last night and kicked the dude's door in. Because he go out. with a black girl. But check this out. on mail, dude. Check it, cuz. It's like this. All right. All right. We can, ha we can handle these fools. That's all right. What I'm thinking about, though, is we need to take out some fools that can make us some money. Dude, I'm talking. That's cool. Dude. That's what I'm fools. talking about. Our first we need to take out some fools that are actually got guns shooting at us and shit. Nick, what the fuck you talking about? Got guns. Them dudes got a lot of guns. They may have they guns, got guns. They got more guns than most of the Let me ask you, you something. About fucking with are life. you more worried about them or are you more worried about slobs? Everybody started veering off in one direction or another. At least several of the people. In fact, I think that's after um, KK was arrested and uh, Trigg was um, finding other people he was hanging out with. And you know, the people that I felt the safest around were suddenly gone. And, and the people that I was left with, a couple in particular, just scared me. And it got scary and abusive. And... I left quickly or be abusive towards me. I never thought and not in a million years that they would do anything. I would completely trusted them. And of course they were all friendly with me when I had my car and was driving them around and when I had a job and had money and so when I quit working and my car blew up then 
well, the phone calls kind of started to slow down and nobody was really that interested since I wasn't driving them around or giving them money or buying their drugs or, you know, whatever. Bang and Little Rock came out on HBO. It was really just embarrassing for me. And then afterwards, all the people, oh my God, I couldn't go to the grocery store. I actually lost a job because of being recognized so much. And oh, I've been to other states, Alabama, New York, and different places to where people recognize me from being on HBO. That white girl on HBO, banging in Little Rock. That white girl. I hear that a lot, yeah. Sometimes I say, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> Just so I don't have to go into any stories. <laughs> I, so yeah, I got out. Yeah, I, it's always gonna be a part of me. A part of my past, I guess. You know, something that I... Kind of cool. Remember him from you know the future? Yeah. Get yeah, check the button. That's it. Great. Hi, Greg. What I've got in the car is I've got some pictures of some uh, kids that died last year. I'm trying to figure out some way to get y'all to put the gas down, you know. And uh, basically what 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 you guys are is an endangered species, you know. And you got to put the guns down. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's dude, triple that, homicide. Uh, crazy. Yeah, they ran up in that house, dude. And it don't matter what color these individuals carry. It don't matter whether they have a blue rag or a red rag. It doesn't matter. They all bleed red. Yes. See, and they Everybody all got mamas. Has the same organs, That's the same right. Size. That's right. So, just, you know, I want you to work me out of a job. This scene in the documentary shows the city's coroner driving around trying to convince the youth in Little Rock to put down the guns. One of the main people who the coroner appeared to have a breakthrough with was a young gang leader for the Bloods named Sonny Boy. He is wearing the red shirt and has cornrows. Sonny Boy is telling the coroner that he knows a crypt that has some pull on the other side of town and he is willing to meet with him to discuss ways to stem the violence in the city. I am glad to report that Sonny Boy did not die due to gun violence but unfortunately he did pass away some years after the film's debut due to complications of diabetes. Brent Owens is known for his gritty and uncompromising approach to filmmaking, and his films often deal with controversial or difficult subjects. Owens has also directed and produced other documentary films, including Pablo Escobar, The True Story of Killing Pablo, and the rough south of Larry Brown. Although he has slowed down considerably in recent years. The last thing of notoriety that I can confirm that Owens directed and produced was a documentary film titled The True Story of Killing Pablo, which was released in 2002. The film explores the life and death of the notorious Colombian drug lord Pablo Escobar and features interviews with individuals involved in his capture and death. Thankfully, not all the news and updates regarding the documentary's participants has turned out for the worst. There is one particular gang member that managed to turn his life around for the better, and is making a positive difference in the same community that he once terrorized. This would be a man by the name of Lethal Jackson, and I am proud to inform you that he has started a non-profit organization for at-risk youth named Roken, reaching out children and neighborhoods after his release from prison. According to my sources, Jackson was inspired to start the organization after his experiences in prison and his realization that he wanted to give back to his community and help at-risk youth stay out of gangs and off the streets. He has worked with community leaders and law enforcement officials to establish the organization and develop its programs and services. He used to be the most feared man in Little Rock. He survived the streets by leading a gang. Now what's he doing? Prison is where LaFell Jackson ended up here in Forest City, Arkansas. I paid my price. I did my time. I came home. You remember me? You just called me OG back then. Oh, gee, I know you. I remember you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. They just show you how things go. Things change. Can I get a hold of it?